do with us this morning, and, and really our task is pretty simple. We're going to be describing and talking about um, our history with Kaitiri Tiri Tumaina, the Southern Alps, uh, and the whole high country of Twai Pānaume with a focus on uh, Auraki. Um, this up here is work that we've been leading over the last 10 years, researching and mapping all of our NITO history on a mapping platform. And we're going to demonstrate our history um, using it today, talking about some of the creation traditions, some of our place names, our old maps, um, and our trails as well. And as Justin said before, a lot of this work is based on Harry Everson and, and of our co during 1980, and all the evidence they gathered for the Waitangi Tribunal. And we've been lucky, Justin and I, to sort of build on that foundation. So um, Justin's going to lead, talking about some of our creation traditions. I'm going to drive from up top, and then um, I'll do a bit of manoeuvring from up there, and I'll come down at the end to finish up. Cool. So um, you would have heard Takere use the term creation traditions. Um, some people know them as myths and legends. To us, they're not myths and legends because that implies they're not true. Uh, our creation traditions are the blueprint that order our society. They provide us with life lessons. And so I'm going to give you a very condensed version. Um, if I was to share with you in great detail, um, some of you might not get a chance to speak. So I'll, I'll keep it quite brief. Um, the, the first tradition I'm going to share with you is Te Waka Wauraki, uh, Auraki's canoe. Now, some of you may be aware with the, um, the northern uh, creation traditions of Rangi and Papa, the sky father and earth mother and the separation and the, the creation of light coming into this world. We have a bit of a prelude to that tradition. Um, to us, uh, Rangi, the sky father, had a wife before Papa Tuanuku, and her name was Pukuharu of the poor, and they, they dwelled in the heavens. And uh, in our traditions, Papa Tuanuku's first husband was the god Tangaroa. Now, while Tangaroa was away um, bearing the placenta of one of their children, Rangi decided to come down from the heavens, and he had a union with uh, Papa Tuanuku, so jumping the fence is nothing new to us. Uh, and uh, after some time, Auraki, Auraki has three brothers, Rakiroa, Rarakiroa, and Rakirua. And after some time, the, the Raki's sons, by his first wife, Pukuharu of Tepo, became curious as to where, where their father was. He'd, he'd been gone for some time. So, bearing in mind, this was in the realm of the gods. They had special powers, the power of incantation. And they boarded their celestial canoe, known as Te Waka Auraki, Auraki's canoe. And through the incantations that were recited, they descended down the heavens and... Uh, saw their father and met his new wife, Papa Tuanuku. They, the army or Haere, they uh, went around the, the earth and they were happy. They said, okay, uh, father's got a new wife, we're happy with that. And they decided, well, we're going to head home. We're going back to our mother. And as they were going through the ocean, Auraki was to uh, recite a karakia, an incantation that would empower the canoe to lift out of the ocean and head back to the, to the heavens. Uh, there's a couple of versions. One, some people say that he erred in his recitation uh, when he was reciting the karakia, and others say he hit a submerged reef. Either way, the canoe um, capsized. It was rough seas, as you can imagine, and the four brothers clambered aboard the upturned hull. And it was there they uh, were turned into stone, and they became what we know as the Southern Alps, Kātiri Tiri o Te Moana. Now that's a very, very brief version. Another version that we have, um, now bearing in mind you may hear alternate versions of these histories, they're all right, no one's wrong. Each family and each subtribal grouping often has variations. Now the stories that I'm sharing, the histories that I'm sharing, are the histories that were recorded from one of our uh, ancestors, Lauri Tamaire, and also um, one of my um, ancestors, Hastings Tipper, who wrote a manuscript on the Arai Te Uru. Um, and Mr. McCaro, um, that was Hastings Tipper, is the grandfather of Wayne and Tony. So the Aurai Tūru tradition speaks of the bringing of the kumara to the South Island. So as the Aurai Tūru, like other main canoes that you may have heard of, Te Arawa, Aotea, Kura Haupo, Taki Timu, um, Aurai Tūru was a lesser known canoe um, carved in the islands and transversed the, uh, the ocean over to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And as they came down the South Island, um, some crew members, uh, they came ashore. You will know Te Tapuwai Uenuku in the Kaikoura Ranges. 
among the Tiri of Mount Grey in Canterbury. And as they carried on south, a storm arose. And off the, the mouth of the Waitaki River, they started to get into a bit of trouble and they lost a couple of crew members. Um, and there's a big rock at the mouth of the Waitaki River, I don't think it's visible at the moment, called uh, Te Mohotiki Atarehu. And as they continued south, they got to around Hamden, just north of Moiraki, where they, they got into a lot of trouble, and they started to throw the cargo overboard. And some of you may know uh, the Moiraki boulders, which I like to call the seventh wonder of the world. Um, to us, they're known as the Kaihinaki. They were the food gourds that were aboard the canoe. As they washed ashore, um, they also were turned to stone and remain to this present day as the giant uh, rock spheres uh, on Hamden Beach. <coughs> Arai Tūru, the canoe, continued um, around the point of Moiraki village and re really it, it rests now and got into a lot of trouble was at a place called Shag Point, Matakaya. Mm -hmm. And you can see the remnants of the canoe to this day um, in Danger Reef. Uh, you can see the upturned hull of the canoe, and on, on top of the canoe uh, is the captain, Hippo. Like all good captains, he went down with the ship. And uh, as the crew, there was 150 crew members on board the Arai Te Uru, and it, it was night time when the canoe founded. So they, some of them made it to shore, and because usually in those times, the times of the gods and, and our ancestors, when you arrive on on a new land, you would conduct the appropriate ceremonies and recite the appropriate karakia to ensure spiritual safety. They didn't have that chance. They arrived at night time. Um, some people were sent south to collect firewood. Um, Puketapu uh, in uh, Palmerston was a, a, one of the slaves aboard the ship and was sent down to collect firewood. Um, but all the hillocks and mountains in North Canterbury, uh, North Otago, South Canterbury, inland, are the, named after the crew members. Mm -hmm. So Auraki, in this tradition, was a young child, was an infant, carried upon the shoulders of his grandfather, a man named Kirikiri Katata. And as they approached uh, this region up here, coming past Waisel, which we know as Timanahuna, they got here and it was, they looked around and they were in awe of the peak, the highest peak on the range that they saw. They looked around, the chief that was with them, and he saw Auraki on the shoulders of his grandfather. As he was coming down the west coast, approaching Bruce Bay, Mahitahi, one of the crew members, it was a beautiful day, which is unusual on the west coast. The sea was calm, which was unusual on the west coast. And they thought they saw some mountains. And one of the crew members exclaimed, Titiro! Look at the mountain range. And then there was a bit of argument. No, no, that's not the mountain range. It's, uh, it's a reflection and it's, it's other things. It's, they, they had a bit of an argument. Anyway, they got down to Bruce Bay, to Mahitahi, and as they pulled into shore, they, they did in fact realise it was a mountain range. They'd never seen snow before, obviously. And it was, uh, and that's where the name Katiri Tiri o Te Moana comes from, and it talks about the reflection on the ocean and the mistake of Maui uh, not believing his crew member that it was a mountain range. Um, they, these are just some of the brief histories that we have. Um, some of the different names we have for the South Island, you've heard Te Waipaunamu, the Greenstone Waters. We have Te Wako Auraki, Auraki's canoe, named after the upturned hull of the canoe. We have Te Waka Maui, um, Maui's canoe, uh, another name that was bestowed upon by the crew of the Takitimu canoe was Te Tumuki. Um, some of my elders at Moiraki also know the South Island as Te Mahutuki Te Rangi. So we have a lot of names for the South Island depending on what part of the island you come from and what traditions you are reciting. But um, Te Waka Auraki, Te Wai Paunamu, Te Waka Maui, they're the most common names uh, that you'll be aware of. Now I'm going to uh, disappear up the back and I'm going to hand it over to Takare who's going to talk about a more recent history. Uh, we're coming out of the realms of the gods now, into the realms of men and, and women. And um, I'm now going to hand it over to Takare. Ke te tika tira, is that right, Takare? Aye. Bye. Bye-bye. So I'm going to go up the back and have a drive of the show. I am going to, I'm going to talk about some of the key maps and people who recorded all of our place names throughout the Southern Alps. Um, and this map here is a map of about 4,500 Māori place names that we've mapped in the last 10 years. 
All of these names come from maps and manuscripts of the 19th century, and all from some of our great 19th century leaders. And I also want to talk about a couple of them um, to look at these early maps. The first map I'm going to talk about was drawn by a person called Tehuda Hudu. Tehuda Hudu was uh, a Ngaitahu uh, Rangatira, a chief of the South Canterbury region. Um, and this is his pass site here, a place called Te Puna Amaru. And this is actually an old survey map of his pa. Um, Tehuda Hudu fought in the wars against Ngāti Tō in the 1830s, but this was his main area of residence. And if you come in here, you can see his pa site located just on the southern bank of the Waitaki River in there, Tehuda Hudu. In 1842, a person by the name of Edward Shortland um, visited this pass site. He was doing a census of the entire South Island Māori population. And when he arrived here, he couldn't cross the river. It was in flood. So Tehuda Hudu looked after him for two or three days. And while Shortland was there, he recorded a whole lot of information from Tehuda Hudu. And this is one of those pieces of information. It's a map drawn in 1842, 1843, of Lake Wanaka and Hawea, and it's one of the earliest maps of, um, of the high country of Tawaipaunamu. And if I zoom in, you'll see we've got Lake Hawea right here. And on the other side, we have what they've recorded as Lake Wanaka, but it's really an orthography era, era of Wanaka. They've just recorded it, didn't quite hear it correctly. And over here, we have Waiariki, which is the Māori name for Stevenson's arm in Lake Wanaka. Uh, Shoreland actually mistakes it for a, th for a third lake, but it's actually a, pa a part of Lake Wanaka. And on here, some of our oldest names. Um, he's got Makarori, which is the correct name for the Makarora River, <laughs> which we call it now, but it's actually an E at the end. And this was the old Māori trail um, through to the west coast. And as you can see on here, Shoreland records two days to Awarua. Um, I reckon I could do that. I don't reckon Justin could. But um, pretty ambitious, but that's what Tehuda Hudu recorded in there. Um, and these other names. Here's the Matakitaki River. Uh, nowadays, it's called the Matukituki. But all these place names you see here are from this person, Tehuda Hudu, um, from South Canterbury. This is our earliest map um, of Wanaka. The next map I want to show you is a map drawn by another one of our esteemed 19th century elders, a guy called... Arauri Tamairi, and he grew up at Lake, at Lake uh, Hawea in a little place called Manuhaya, which is right in here. Now, I'm going to cut between things here. This is Arauri Tamairi here. Um, he passed away sort of at the end of the 1800s, but he was one of our leading um, knowledge experts, and he had wānangas and, and houses of learning where people would go and learn old traditions and histories. But Tamaiti grew up at Lake Hawea. And this is a photograph of Lake Hawea before it was raised. And this is an old famous lagoon called Manuhaya. And this is where our people settled and lived. It was a famous place for gathering eels. When I first started working for Naitahu, all of our people would say Manuhaya. That was a famous food gathering um, place where we used to gather tuna. And this is an amazing photograph showing what the lagoon was like. Um, and that. Well, anyway, Tamaiti grew up here. And as a five-year-old, he had to escape. Um, a tribe called Ngāti Tama um, attacked Ngaitahu down the west coast of the South Island. And they came down to Uripatia in the Wānaka, and they came to Manuhaya. And as a five-year-old, Araudi Tamaiti escaped down uh, Lindis Pass all the way down to the Waitaki to live. But Tamaiti lived up in Lake Harvey at certain times of the year. And he drew this incredible map in 1897. And this is an, an incredibly detailed map of Wānaka and Hawea, showing all our sediments, all our place names, all of our kāinga mahinga kai. And, that, and it was drawn for a local survey in 1897. If I come up to Old Aki, you can see here, He's got the names that Justin talked about this morning, just before, in the Tuaka or Aoraki tradition. So all of these names that you see in front of you here, these are all place names of food gathering sites and past sites and settlements. And as you can see, the high country is completely chocker block. It's completely full of, of our places. Now, getting there was a bit gnarly. And this map is a map of all of our traditional Māori travel routes. 
to come, to come up to Old Aki to receive a way to you come up here. Uh, up the Waitaki, remembering before the lakes were flooded, they weren't there. So our people used to come up here, come straight up what is now Lake Benmore, and up to the Mackenzie Basin. Um, Hakataramia, which is really Whakataramia, that was an old Māori trail up to Mackenzie Basin. And for our people on Tamuka, Arofenua, uh, Mackenzie Pass and Burke's Pass were the two main travel routes. So basically what you have are all these Ngāi settlements and communities all coming up here at certain times of the year to gather food. And you've got to remember when our people came down here, they came to a place where they never really experienced before. You know, it was fr- at certain times of the year, it was completely freezing. You couldn't gather food. And our people developed new storage techniques and gathering techniques of, of food. And the high country was a massively important part of that. I read this amazing manuscript of a guy called Teki Pukurako, who was um, one of the last great users of mokahi, the tepe rafts. And as recorded, he would come up here to Lake Spoho, Takapo, Pukaki, and gather wicker and tuna. And what he used to do, he used to dry all the eels beforehand, big sort of dry racks, then he would prepare them all, pack them on his raft, and he would paddle down the, the Waitaki back to his home at the Waitaki River mouth. And there he would store them in this massive sort of um, storage areas in that. So this whole high country area during certain times of the year was absolutely buzzing. You had people coming here, gathering food, using trails, but it was packed. At certain times of the year, it was too cold, so people weren't up here. But at certain times of the year, they were, and that's really important. This is a map of Kemp Steed. Um, this is when the Crown purchased the South Island of Maitahu, they did it in eight or nine, ten different land purchases. And one of them was the Canary Targo area. And it's called Kemp Steed after Henry Tacey Kemp, who comes down to negotiate this deed of sale. And he comes down and meets our people, and they negotiate this purchase. And they agree on pretty much three things. The northern boundary is a mountain called Maunga Tiri near Paipoi. The southern boundary is called Maunga Atua, which is by the Dunedin Airport. And the inland boundary are the foothills that connect these two mountains. So that's what they agree on. Kent's like, that's awesome. We're done, we're dusted, we're off. Kent goes back. Kent, to be fair, he's not very good in detail. So he goes up there and his chief survey is arguing with him, gets all these things mixed up. He doesn't really complete the data purchase. And he's all these things he doesn't do. So in the end, they send another agent down, Walter Mantell. And he comes down in the same year, 1848, and his job is to finish the deed. And as he comes down, Mantell shows this map, or a map like this to our Naitohi chiefs. And they look at the map, and remember, they have never seen this map before, so it's all brand new to them. So they look at the northern boundary, yep, Maunga Teddy, that's what we agreed to. We look at the southern boundary, going Atua, that's what we agreed to. But the inland boundary doesn't go to the foothills, it goes to the west coast. <laughs> which is a massive, massive jump. So straight away our people mm. start complaining to, to Mantel. That's not part of the deal, we said the foothills, not that that's it. And Mantel says, well that's not, I'm not here to argue that, that's that's been dealt with, I'm here to establish a reserves. The following year, Naito then petitioned the government that things aren't quite working out as planned. And that's really the start of the Naitahu flame. And for Naitahu, the whole Southern Alps, the whole Mackenzie Basin, Wanaka Hawea, is what we call the hole in the middle, the area that we never sold, and that's what that refers to. And really, that's the start where our tribal relationship with this area sort of stops. Because all of a sudden, we could get poisoned, wetlands get drained, farms are established, and people can't come up here. Now, the next 30, 40 years, it sort of diminishes, really to the point of no return, to be honest. And that, um, and I will need Justin to go to the map if he can. Now, Omadam is a really famous place in Naitahu history. Um, in 1877, uh, 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 Naitahu, sort of famous religious leader, Pipita um, he was he was really into the, this high country being sold, or assumed ownership of the crown. So he, he leads a group of 200 people and they camp here at Omarna for about two years in protest of the crown asserting ownership. And eventually they end up leaving in 1879 um, when the, native, the Minister of Affairs comes down. But the whole point is, is that our people 
were actively engaging, actively using it, and then it stopped. But the real cool story, one of the real cool stories is there were these Naito families who kept using the high country, kept coming up here. And um, Bob's research on, um, on the early mount Māori mountaineer guides up at Aoraki is some of the best research that I've ever seen on early Naito mountaineers. And there's this little community um, on the west coast, Bruce Bay, where um, Justin talked about, where the waka, uh, Maui's waka arrived. And these people are our first mountain um, guides. In 1912, George Bannister becomes the first Naito person to stand in Auraki and that. And then his descendants, they keep using this area and they're involved in here for sort of 40, 50 years. And then we move on to Naito claim, their settlement, and all of a sudden our tribal engagement with this area increases. And we have Hikoi's up here, we have Auraki bound, we have groups coming up here using Waka and Lake Pukaki and we're engaging with it. And the real thing for us in the future is how to keep this engagement going. It was a place that was massively used by us, it stopped, and now it's continuing. And in opportunities like this, when he's doing an Alpine Club, to invite us to come up here to share our story, these are the things we need to keep going to the future. Not at a Kanatamiki Koto, Kanatamiki Koto, Kanatamiki Koto.